Hello and welcome to the Rural Doctors Program. I'm Geraldine Mellett and I'm filling in for Jerry Gannon who is off with the cows quite literally this week at a Queensland beef industry conference very appropriately for this program. Now as rural doctors you're likely to see many patients who work with or around animals and there are a number of health issues that are particularly relevant or unique to those working in animal agriculture. So this evening, our, some of the health issues that can arise from contact with animals is going to be canvassed, as well as those with some more exotic wildlife species. Also tonight, we'll hear from allergist Dr. Colin Somerville about the causes and the management of animal and plant allergies. And we're going to have a chat with the always obliging Dr. Stephen Langford, medical director of the Royal Flying Doctor Service about snake bite. Those stories a little later, but right now, let me introduce you to our panel for this evening. Dr. Olga Ward is with us once again to chair our discussion tonight. Welcome, Olga. Thanks, Geraldine. Uh, and joining her are two veterinarians, Professor John Edwards, Dean of the School of Veterinary and Biomedical Science at Murdoch University. Welcome, John. Thanks, Geraldine. And as well, we have Associate Professor in Veterinary Public Health, Stanley Fennick, also from Murdoch University, who prefers to be called Stan. Welcome. <laughs> Thank you. So thanks to all of you also for, for coming in tonight. Now, before we begin, a reminder that this is an interactive program. So if you have any questions for Olga, Stan or John, you can have your say at any time. You just need to give us a call on 1800 673 277 or 08 922 95241. Over to you, Olga. Thanks, Jerry, and welcome. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Could we start by talking about domestic pets? They being overall, I think, in medicine, the most common things that our patients are in contact with. Um, and I guess the thing that our patients ask us most about is worms. Okay. Can my child get worms from the dog, the cat, or indeed from the other children that they happen to be playing with? Well, they certainly can. There's a, a number of different types of worms that they that they can get that in rural areas or urban areas. Uh, the, the, the classic ones, roundworms, that uh, Toxicara species that yeah. passed out in dog feces and children playing in public parks pick up uh, bits of feces and get it into their mouths and uh, and the, the larvae actually then sort of migrate around the body not knowing where they are and uh, end up in obscure places like the brain or the eye and, mm -hmm. and can cause fairly nasty. It's very rare but can cause nasty, nasty symptoms. Yeah. So that's uh, stuff like Toxicara. Mm -hmm. I seem to remember that children were getting hookworm quite frequently, particularly in the northwest. Is that also a dog parasite? It is, yes. It's another. It's a worm in the dog and, and the larvae are, are in the soil, particularly in moist conditions, uh, which is you know, up in the north during the wet, I suppose. And uh, children running around barefoot get the larvae into mm -hmm. the feet. Got actually a picture on there that might come up at some stage of, uh, of the, yeah, with the, with the hookworms. Uh, so they can be pretty nasty lesions. They're not life-threatening, but uh, not pleasant. Okay, so what sort of symptoms would the kids have? Uh, those kind of lesions on the feet there, sort of itchy feet, uh, itchy skin as the larvae sort of crawl under the skin, the cutaneous larval migrans and, and uh, yeah. But d they don't get diarrhea? No, no, not. Um, so not that's just the, it's an intestinal parasite in, in, the, in dog, the dog, but it doesn't right. actually that's cause right. the child that sort yeah, of symptom. Yeah. What about other things that we can get from our domestic pets? Well, there's a whole range of things, and I probably don't want to talk for two hours, but <laughs> uh, the one that the, the rural practitioners might be uh, very familiar with is, is hydatids, yeah. uh, which really are, are, are fairly obscure now. Uh, hydatid disease has been eradicated in Tasmania but, uh, and in the mainland Australia from the dog population, but uh, it seems to be making a bit of a comeback. There's some, there's recently in Queensland, there were, which Jerry might be finding out about, uh, the uh, hydatid disease in cattle, so it's a dog okay. ruminant cycle. It's oh, a dog right, tapeworm. Right. Yes, because I've always yeah. always thought of hydatids as being something that uh, that came through in grass eating animals. Well, that's where you see the cysts, but in fact, the people get it from patting a dog, and getting the sort of the, the tapeworm segments off a dog's fur, like you know, like mm -hmm. children pat dogs and. Yes, know, and dogs I'm sure you've got some <laughs> particularly goozy there's photographs a, a of hydatids. There's a couple of photos. Yeah, the hydatids. I don't know how many surgeons will, will see them these days, but there's. Uh, these very nasty cysts that uh, that occur in in the internal organs uh, that uh, are 
can be life-threatening and yep. are very difficult to remove. You've got a picture there that would strike fear into any parent's heart and assist in a child's brain. I mean, how, how common is that? Very, very rare now uh, in, in Australia, but uh, in places like Asia and China, it's becoming, a, you know, it's a major problem. And, you know, while a lot of our rural practitioners will have people who travel overseas and come back, it's something you've got to keep in mind. They're very uh, easily preventable through just good uh, practice. And, of course, in... Uh, New Zealand and Tasmania, um, high doses have been eliminated. So is that through just everybody oh, washing their hands yeah, or well they've vaccinated the dogs? No, state, state and national programs to detect dogs with um, high doses and then treatment of, of dogs and also educating the public about uh, not feeding offal to dogs mm -hmm. and uh, trying to prevent the exposure of, uh, of humans. Yeah. Now I know a lot of farmers will kill their own animals for meat for the family and some of them even still eat mm. liver and bacon fry-ups and such like. Is there any risk of high datids from that? Well, as I say, it's making a comeback because in, in Australia there is actually a, a wild cycle as well which involves mm -hmm. kangaroos and dingoes and, and it seems you know, it can spill over from dingoes and wild or feral dogs into the domestic dog population on a farm, for example. So you have to be careful to sort of break this cycle and try and stop feeding, as John says, offal, raw offal, you know, just chucking the intestines to the dog at the end of the day. And, Cook meat. Cook everything. Yeah. I, I worked in Albany for a long while back in the 70s and 80s and there were programs down there to control both hydatids but also a, a sheep a disease uh, called uh, Cystocircus ovus and there was a lot of education programs and that was quite successful in reducing the prevalence at that stage. And are those sorts of programs ongoing in Western Australia? Or are these the things that the parents of our farmers would now have <coughs> uh, participated in? Well, I think there's still materials around and uh, I don't think there's any uh, programs as targeted as that, but they're certainly materials and it's something that uh, um, every uh, medico and, and veterinarian needs to keep, uh, keep working on. Mm. Now, although high datids are uh, horrific and rare, I guess there are some, some other kind of common things that our patients get from their cats and dogs. How often do you see ringworm these days? Uh, ringworm's reasonably common. And you know, you don't even really have to have contact with with the, the cat itself because often the the spores from the ringworm fungus can be around the house. They're quite long-lasting. I mean, my daughter went to a, a friend's house and never saw a cat and came back with absolutely perfect ringworm. Didn't want mm -hmm. to photograph for lesions because they're in a delicate <laughs> place. But uh, wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, and there's a picture of ringworm. I mean, I'm sure many of the medics uh, have seen it. That's that's probably uh, the relate a cattle cattle ringworm, which seems to be more m more uh, inflammatory than mm -hmm. the, the, ring, the dog and cat ringworm, but uh, it's the same sort of picture, this mm -hmm. ring with a sort of a red lesion around the outside. So in terms of actually eradicating the thing from a household, how do you go about that? It's, it's actually very difficult if your cat or dog has it. Uh, sometimes it's asymptomatic in cats and dogs, you might not see it. But if the cat or dog does, does have it, you've really got to wash the bedding and sort of get you know, in hot detergent and, and where the cat's been lying around. It's not that easy. All right, so vacuum your furniture and... Yeah, that's right, yeah. Catteries are the big problem when someone's got a cattery and it gets in there. It's yeah. very difficult to get rid of. And you might get ken kennel workers or people like coming down with it. Yeah. Not life-threatening. Mm. Yeah. Speaking of cats, can we get cat flu? Ah, John's the flu expert here. Was <laughs> <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Different strain. <laughs> so cats, cats with runny noses are just cats with runny noses. Yeah. That, that's right. Not, well, not, not that I'd be particularly no. fond of uh, contact with yeah. cats, not, but... Yeah. Yeah. Well, but not, not for humans. Yeah. You can get other things from kissing mm. your pets, though. You know, yeah? yeah it's, Such uh, as? Well, th there's a range of bacteria that, that cats and dogs have in their mouths that humans don't have. And uh, with immunosuppressed people, mm. uh, if they're kissing their pets and getting... Uh, there's a classic story of a, an old lady with meningitis. Uh, and it was Pasturella meningitis, and she... It was in the British Medical Journal, and uh, she claimed to sort of kiss her dog which also had a broken mouth. It was an ancient oh. dog as well and uh, obviously the pastorilla had got from the dog's mouth into her when she kissed it every mm -hmm. night and she had this meningitis. So, you know, the moral of the story is don't kiss your pet. Uh, mm -hmm. Can I ask about toxoplasmosis? Um, mm. is, is that very common? I mean, you hear about, you know, the, the fear of it with pregnant women in particular? The disease itself in people is, is very uncommon, but uh, people are commonly infected with toxoplasma. What, and don't realise? Uh, don't, yeah. The, most infections in people would be asymptomatic. Uh, in healthy adults and healthy children, uh, you probably wouldn't notice anything. So when does it become well, a problem? Well, I, I can actually give you a case study because uh, back uh, a long time ago, I actually had toxoplasmosis and uh, it was um, sort of uh, lymphadenopathy and uh, severe lethargy. Um, 
I think it, avoided, it helped me to avoid uh, sitting my exams one year, so it was actually an advantage. It's <laughs> <That's> pretty tough. <laughs> <call>. <laughs> but, uh, but no, it was. Uh, yeah, I had a. I was one of the unusual cases that actually had it. Mm. Yeah. So and I was actually even more unusual, and I had it twice, which is not supposed to happen. Mm. So if we had, say, had a pregnant mm. woman with a febrile illness mm. and lymphadenopathy, that would be a useful thing to test for. A bit of a pointer, sure. yeah. I mean, yeah. there are some countries that do uh, testing of pregnant women as routine, uh, serological mm -hmm. testing, yeah. but uh, Australia is not one of them. Some of the Scandinavian countries, mm. because many of the, of the population, I mean, out of the four of us, two of us yeah. might be might have antibodies to yes. toxoplasma because we've mm -hmm. come in contact with it. Yeah. It's the people that haven't come in, the pregnant women that have never come in contact with toxoplasma that are at risk. But if so we carry it within us, um, is there some stage of, if we become immunosuppressed, for instance, is it going to become a problem? It could do, yeah. yes. Certainly yeah. in immunosuppressed people, it's, yeah. uh, it's become a, a, one of the rising problems in HIV patients, for example, yeah. as toxoplasma, mm -hmm. which is, yeah. The reason that uh, so many people get exposed is that you can either pick it up through eating raw uh, meat uh, or not fully cooked or, or an exposure to cats that are infected with it as well. So there's lots of opportunities for people. That's right. It's, it's, it's important to, to that it's not just the cats that are to blame, mm -hmm. as John mm -hmm. says. The, the cats are the definitive host, but any animal that eats cat feces accidentally on grass, like mm -hmm. sheep and cattle, and get, the cysts, get the cysts <laughs> in their meat, so raw meat, yeah. Mm -hmm. Or dig, digging in the garden, you know, with the cats. So. Mm -hmm. Mm. Around, yeah. So if you did have a pregnant woman, say, with a febrile illness, is toxoplasma something in humans that you can actually treat treat for on the basis of symptoms, or would you have to wait for the serology to come back? Yes, I'm not actually sure you know, what symptoms a pregnant woman would have. It might be that she didn't have symptoms at all, and that really the symptoms are going to be seen in the, mm -hmm. congenitally in, in the child. Uh, and it really depends on the stage of pregnancy. Yeah. In, yeah. In, the, in the first trimester, it's not as severe as in the third trimester. Mm. So did they give you any treatment, John? Yeah, uh, there was uh, some fairly, uh, well, these days it would be considered to be primitive antibiotics that uh, we used, but it, uh, it took a long time to get over it. Okay, so that's just yeah. something that we need to, to yeah. have a, on our radar yeah. at yeah. all times. Yeah. And it's sort of... It, and you, sorry, you said it, it came back again. So does it recur even well, though it was... Well, it's not supposed to, but uh, I, I actually had a recurrence and uh, um, must have been the exams again. <laughs> <laughs> there are some people that think it's more common mm. than it, than, it, than realised. Yeah. Uh, now the other thing that we frequently hear about, um, particularly in our pathology exams and occasionally when we see large quantities of coughing patients is psittacosis. <laughs> um, and... Mm. Do you do you just pick up psittacosis from asymptomatic birds, or is the parrot going to also look well, sick? Well, a bit of both. Yeah, uh, parrot fever can be. Uh, you, you can get sick parrots. You know the classic John Cleese Monty Python story with the sick parrot, the dead parrot. But uh, you can get uh, parrots can have enteritis, can have uh, pneumonia uh, under stress, uh, mm -hmm. which they might be in pet shops if they're crammed into cages, or they can be shedding it asymptomatically. The classic. Uh, Rural case, cases were over in the, the Blue Mountains where the, the exposure was through people mowing their lawns and it was through pa dried parrot feces being blown up by the lawn mowers and people came, oh. there was a cluster of cases. Gosh. Yeah. So they didn't even see a parrot. But <laughs> <laughs> so it's a somebody, very long-lived yeah. long organism in feces. If somebody kept domestic birds, for instance, and they, they were having very persistent cough, then this would be something, again, that we would probably test for. Sure. And in rural areas, you know, on stations where there may be, you know, hundreds of thousands of budgerigars or galahs or something like yeah. that. Yeah. I'm also thinking about uh, many cases of wildlife workers, you know, because people do pick up sick and injured wildlife, and in rural areas there's many opportunities to do so. Well, the zoo, uh, the Perth yeah. Zoo that we work closely with, they've They've had calm workers, uh, conservation and land management workers, dealing with black cockatoos, for example, that have come down with psittacosis. So, yeah. mm. well, I guess, I mean, some of the things we've already talked about and many of the things we're going to talk about later, it's all about just taking you know, basic um, precautions. And uh, I mean, I don't kiss budgerigars <laughs> uh, or cats <laughs> or uh, those sort of things because uh, there are um, outside chances of actually being able to pick these things up. Mm -hmm. I think that's the message. Yeah. They're, not, they're not, not very common. So yeah. hygiene, hygiene, yeah. hygiene, hand hygiene, 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 that's exactly, right. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Stan, could you tell us a little bit about Q fever and perhaps its spread in the vaccination program? It's something that patients often ask about and as a GP I don't think we get a great deal of education about it. Yeah, certainly in a rural area it's a disease that's, that would be more common than most. It's the most common zoonosis in Australia. 
agricultural workers in people in abattoirs, for example, uh, would be the people most at risk. It's uh, easily spread. There's lots of cycles, but the, the traditional way is through ruminants in, in abattoirs are the, the highest risk mm -hmm. group. Uh, and the, the organism itself is very, very resistant in the environment. I mean, so much so the Americans have got it on their number one list of potential bioterrorism agents because it, it's, it's got a cyst that can survive for many, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, and then it blows around in the dust, gets inhaled, and you get this sort of atypical pneumonia that uh, can develop, and occasionally endocarditis. And, oh, right. Yeah. So it doesn't actually have to be direct contact with the animals. You could be, yeah. say, driving yeah. a truckload of animals into the yard of an abattoir yeah. and pick it up. Yeah. That's and even on farms, uh, the yards on farms is a very common source. Mm -hmm. So we, we, we actually, uh, um, and Stan coordinates a program to vaccinate all our veterinary students mm -hmm. uh, as part of the prevention to make sure because they're mm -hmm. going into abattoirs, going onto mm -hmm. farms, dealing with animals in places where they could easily be exposed. Mm. And many of the abattoirs actually insist that their employees are, uh, are vaccinated. Mm. You, to be vaccinated, in fact, it's, a, it's a quite a lengthy process. Well, because I was going to say, it seems to be very complicated yeah. when I've asked for vaccination for patients. It's not, just not something that a GP can order the vaccine and give. No, the, 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 the complication is the fact that uh, you, have to, you have to go through a skin test and a blood test beforehand to make sure you mm. haven't been exposed before. Because if you've been exposed, then you can actually get a nasty reaction to the vaccine. So you've got to get this skin test, blood test, then go back. And if you've had no antibodies and no raised skin lesion, mm -hmm. then you can get vaccinated. Yeah. Right. Now, the blood what? test a GP could do, yeah. but I guess the skin test has to be done with a specific antigen by yeah, a specific I, centre? I, we get the travel doctors uh, to come and do our work for us because they're dealing with a lot of these things and they come and do a, a mass sort of a treatment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of the big issues uh, with Q fever is the unreliability of vaccine sources. Mm. And for example, when um, they uh, put uh, a lot of effort into trying to um, create vaccines and uh, antivirals for avian influenza, um, the uh, vaccines for Q fever went off the market. And that puts a lot of people at risk if you, you can't get access to the, the vaccines. Well, there's nowhere else in the world mm. that makes a, a Q, oh, right. Q fever yeah. vaccine. Yeah. Mm. But, uh, Except for where? In here? Australia, in Australia. CSL, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. if they take the resources mm. off one? Yep, yeah. and the, the government had, a, a, about two years ago, they had a, a free program for agricultural workers for about, that lasted for about two years, abattoir and farmers and such like. And then they stopped that, so I don't know. Yeah. Once you've been through that process of being vaccinated, do you have to have, you know, um, updates sort of later on? No, it's, or that's it, seems, it? it seems to be a lifelong immunity. Right. Yeah. 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 Mm. I guess some of our patients have, have contact with all sorts of animals, and the other ones that do appear in agricultural areas are horses. And I was wondering, John, if you could mm. tell us a little bit about that racehorse virus that killed the vet. Okay, well there's two racehorse viruses that have gone recently. One's the equine influenza, which uh, escaped quarantine and affected large numbers, and I'm happy to talk about that if anyone's interested. But the, uh, the Hendra virus is the one uh, that uh, killed the vet um, recently. And uh, Hendra virus, I guess, is maybe one of the rarest diseases in the world, in that there's only um, been six people affected in the world, uh, but half of them have died. Um, three of them have died. There's been about 36 horses affected um, on 11 different, at 11 different sites. But this is uh, actually caused by, um, it's uh, the natural host is the flying fox or the fruit bats. And so, and those fruit bats occur um, in Queensland, but also into the Northern Territory and into the Kimberley. And occasionally they go a little bit south of that. But so anyone in the North of Australia really uh, is at risk of a very rare disease. The reason it occurs is that the flying foxes um, occasionally come in contact with horses and contaminate them. There's a thought that uh, it might be um, flying foxes uh, um, during the breeding season, or sorry, during pregnancy, and that uh, uh, they can contaminate um, uh, food sources, they can contaminate, mm -hmm. because they live in trees, over and uh, horses grazing underneath the trees can be infected oh, so by they heavily by, by poo fluids. on the grass. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and other and other um, yeah. fluids uh, as well. And then the uh, horses, um, when they're treated, all the cases that have had um, Hendra virus have been very close contact with the um, the infected horses. And so, some you might um, recall the Vic Rail incident where the horse trainer who died, the first case that mm. was no, uh, noticed. Um, he was force feeding 
horses because they were sick and then um, he, uh, he then picked it up himself and then died. One of the, um, uh, I guess, even though it's a rare disease, I guess the, the wake up call for veterinarians, for horse owners in Queensland is if you want to prevent yourself getting affected with, with a disease like this that's really serious, even though it might be rare, again, you've got to take precautions Hygiene to... Precautions. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Now that's this one, sorry, the other one, the other aspect of this um, is that um, it, it expresses itself in a number of different ways, both in horses and humans. It's uh, shown as respiratory disease and also neurological disease. But um, at least a couple of the cases have, um, the person has had the disease, shown signs, then it's um, relapsed, sorry, and then sometime later, up to a year, before it relapsed, then the person's died. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite a difficult one to deal with. Yeah. We might leave it mm. there for the moment. Sure. That I? sounds like a really interesting oh, vector yeah. and we we'll, mm. might bring the discussion back at that point after the break. Sure. Thanks Olga. Hypersensitivity and allergies of all forms are unfortunately becoming more and more common. An allergy can be debilitating for anyone but for those living and working on the land, an allergy to animals or plants can directly threaten their livelihood. Dr Colin Somerville is an allergist in private practice here in Perth and we spoke to him about the most common causes and symptoms of animal and plant allergies and asked his advice on how to approach treatment. Most of the people that I see from the country actually are not animal allergic at all. I mean, that actually, I think, plays a very small part of it. Most of what they suffer from, I mean, most of the farmers in the wheat belt come and tell me that they can't go out and farm during the day when, the, when everything's in seed because they have such terrible hay fever or terrible allergic conjunctivitis. So I think allergies to airborne things like wild oats and canola and now lupin and wheat uh, pollen, they'd be the things that you know, would cause most problems and most morbidity for people. Um, animal allergies you see less often and to be perfectly honest I can't remember the last time I saw someone who came in who said that they had an allergic reaction when they were around their cattle or their sheep. It's usually around the grasses. Most of the animal allergens that you see are again to indoor animals like cats. I mean cat allergen is by far the most severe allergic uh, animal that you'll come across. The cat allergen is very volatile. It can stay in the air undisturbed for days and days and days. It can stay in a house for up to two or three years after a cat's been removed from it. And cat allergen is very strongly associated with asthma. And uh, uh, children who are cat allergic in particular tend to have more severe asthma and they tend to have more um, hospital admissions and more intensive care unit admissions. So it's a very important allergen to identify because often you can remove that allergen from their house and their asthma goes away and otherwise you end up treating them with huge doses of steroids and chasing your tail and never getting anywhere. So that would be the, the main animal allergen that I would see. Even if you've been out there for 20 or 30 years, I'm sure you, you'll still remember that you can break down allergic reactions into different sort of categories. Uh, uh, the so-called Gell and Coombs classification of allergic responses, we have type 1, 2, 3 and 4. And the type 1 is a, an immediate reaction and that's a reaction that's usually antibody driven through IgE. And that's the sort of thing that we can test for with a skin prick test or a RAS test. And then you have various sorts of delayed type reactions. So for example, if someone brushes against a grevillea, it may take 48 hours before they get a rash coming up from that. And that again can be quite different to a, a, a serum sickness type reaction, which can actually take several weeks to come on after you've had an antibiotic. So these are all different sorts of allergic reactions. Not only do you see allergic reactions to chemicals, but you often see toxic reactions. If it's a toxic sort of reaction, usually that comes up fairly quickly and people can tell you, you know, they put their hands in the sheep dip and instantly they start to burn and then they get a rash there within a few hours. Now, most of these sort of chemicals will come with a material safety data sheet. So if someone's been working with chemicals and has a rash and it comes up quick, pretty quickly after handling it, you can look at the material uh, information uh, sheet and that'll usually tell you yes skin rash is a common sort of side effect of this particular substance uh, and, and so it's usually pretty obvious you tell the people they're going to have to wear gloves when they're handling those sort of chemicals that's pretty easy if the material safety sheet says oh look there's no evidence that this causes skin conditions then you start wondering about well if it's happened in 
fairly close proximity to this compound and it's not something that you commonly see with it, maybe you're an individual who's allergic to it. Um, the only way to test for that is to do a patch test. Whether you want to test someone to see if it's their makeup or their shampoo or some chemical they're handling at work, you, you can buy these pretty readily. These are called fin chambers and all they are is a little sort of um, uh, metal disc on an adhesive background and what you can do is you get little filter papers you can put the little filter papers in the spaces and you drop a little bit of that compound onto that you're worried about onto one of these and you stick it onto someone's back usually between their shoulder blades and you leave it on for 48 hours and then you take it off and you have a look at it and then sometimes you have to wait a further 72 hours and check them again now this is a sort of testing that if I do it I have to have people here in Perth for a week to do it but if you're wondering about some specific chemical, you can do it down there pretty easily. You put a patch like that on, take it off in 48 hours, have a look at it another 24 hours later, and if they've developed some form of dermatitis or rash underneath it, just like the ones they might be getting on their hands or wherever, you can be absolutely certain that that's the compound that's doing it. Now, there are special chemicals you can buy that test for individual substances, and you know, a dermatologist would use those, but you know, I do this with people's shampoos and with their makeup, and you can do the same thing with any chemical that you're worried about. But the first step is always have a think about the relationship between the substance you're being exposed to and how long afterwards you actually see a reaction occurring. And that'll tell you whether you should be doing an allergy test or whether this is just a tox toxic side effect from a substance which anybody handling it is likely to get. Most of the severe allergic conditions that I see, though, affect people's airways. And these are the people who get asthma when they're exposed to wheat dust, people who get uh, you know, terrible uh, allergic conjunctivitis or their nose blocks up, or they just feel terribly tired and run down. You can take an antihistamine or a nasal spray if it's an upper airway symptom, or you can take asthma puffers if it's a lower airway symptom. But again, those are only controlling some of the symptoms, and people are still going to feel pretty dreadful if they're very, very allergic. So. What we generally do, or what, what you usually do by the time you come to my sort of uh, uh, end of the, uh, the whole spectrum, is we talk to people about desensitising them. And that's by far the most effective way of controlling any sort of uh, allergic sensitisation. Now, first thing to know is you can't do that for foods. I frequently get people referred to me because they're allergic to peanuts or eggs and they want to be desensitised to those. You can't do that. But you can very effectively desensitise to grasses and by that I mean also things like oat and wheat because oat and wheat cross-react almost 100% with ryegrass and we can desensitise to that very, very easily. When you desensitise to those sorts of things, the figures show that 80 to 90% of people get 80 to 90% better. Now there's probably going to be a whole lot of GPs out there who are going to say, oh no, no, I've not seen that in every patient that I've referred. Because if you, if you imagine that inside someone's nose and airways, they've got a chronic reaction going on for six months of the year where you've got lots of swelling and lots of chemicals being produced. And they have that going on for a total of, you know, six months every year for the last 30 years. That doesn't go without causing any long-term changes in your nose. You end up with polyps forming over 10 to 15 years. You end up with people developing sinus infection. You end up with them having scarring in their nose and sinuses, which interferes with drainage from their nose. So you get all those other complications and as a result of those complications, if you're 45 when you come to me and we start treatment and you've already got polyps and you've already got sinus disease and scarring, I'm probably not going to make you 90% better. We'll probably take the edge off things, but you're probably still going to need some medications. Whereas if you refer someone when they're 12 or 13 or 21 or 22, you're going to make them much, much better and you're going to prevent all those things further down the line. The trouble is... I think a lot of doctors are frightened to give desensitising injections. They're worried that if they give somebody some toxic substance that they're allergic to, that that person might die and then someone's going to hold them responsible because they injected it in the first place. Desensitising is very safe, it's very effective and the younger you start it, the better. All you need to have is a bit of adrenaline in the surgery and you need to make sure that your patients wait for half an hour. And in 20 years, I've never had a bad reaction here in my rooms that I haven't been able to treat with a single shot of adrenaline and the patient go home 30 or 40 minutes later, ever. And the same should apply to you. So you shouldn't be frightened and you shouldn't hold back with doing this because you're worried about because you're denying people a very, very effective treatment. And generally what happens is, I'll bring people up here for an interview, we'll discuss what they're allergic to, we'll give them the first injection here and we send them back to you to continue. So if you have a patient who comes to see you and you think they've got uh, some sort of allergic condition, pin them down first of all on what their symptoms are. If you identify what their symptoms are, you can then go ahead and work out whether it's likely to be allergy or something else.
You can do the patch testing as we talked about. You can do RAS testing. You can also skin prick test if you want to, but I'd probably just stay away from that because you need a lot of material for that. Just do a RAS test or refer them. And finally, when it comes to treating, refer them to a, a specialist like me when nothing else is working, the nasal sprays and antihistamines aren't enough, the topical steroids aren't enough, and you think it's time you want to try something a bit more uh, long-lasting and a bit more aggressive, in other words, desensitising. And you can do all that treatment yourselves. Don't be frightened to do it. It's very straightforward and very safe. Now, thanks to Dr. Somerville for taking the time to talk to us. Before we return to our studio discussion, just a reminder to call in any time if you have any questions or comments for discussion. And the number is 01800 673 or 08 now before we get back into talking about bats, which is I think where we left it, there was an article that you drew our attention to, Stan, from uh, yesterday's local paper about piggery workers which have, who had been hit by a disease pretty hard. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, it's always nice to have something topical to talk about. Uh, and in yesterday's West there was two piggery workers from New South Wales that came down with uh, uh, Streptococcus suis associated with, with pigs. Uh, a, a bacteremia followed by toxic shock syndrome, which is most unpleasant. We've got a photo up there, and that's from a, a Chinese outbreak, which was, it's very strange because up until about, till 2005, when this outbreak happened in China, where a number of deaths, it was a very, very rare disease in most parts of the world. But for some strange reason, like many of these things do, they, they, it's changed its virulence pattern. And so seeing those two cases today, in well, yesterday's paper, uh, begs the question, you know, we ought to keep our eye on workers coming in from uh, pig-related industries with, uh, you know, septicemia and, and various other problems, yeah. What's the sort of prognosis on these people? Well, it depends. If they get a septicemia and one of these people had endocarditis so, uh, and, and the other one had toxic shock syndrome and, and brain lesions, and so they, they both recovered, but uh, they can have, you know, uh, lasting uh, meningitis-related symptoms for, for many years. It's not a pleasant disease. No, none of them are very pleasant diseases, no. are they? Rare <laughs> but Particularly unpleasant. good That's pictures right. tonight. <laughs> um, well, back to bats, and which is where we left it before. We did, and bats seem to me to be quite an unusual vector, and I guess you've mostly talked about tropical bats, but I seem to remember bats all over the wheat belt. Is it just the fruit bats that you worry about? Well, the ones, uh, I'll list a, a number of diseases, uh, new and emerging diseases, that have now been associated with uh, bats and flying foxes. But in Western Australia, we do have um, flying foxes in the north, so they're a significant issue. But there are um, bats of a variety of bats in the southwest of uh, Western Australia, and some of these diseases could be possible. Uh, noting that these, the thing about diseases now is they're changing all the time, and the, we call, call, talk about uh, emerging infectious diseases, and a number of those are coming in bats. And for example, in Australia, we've had diseases like menangal um, virus in uh, New South Wales, the bat lissa virus, which is a rabies-like disease mm -hmm. in, on, along the east coast, and that could be carried by a number of different bat types. The, uh, if you look at the big disease issues of recent times that have caused big significant human uh, deaths, SARS, the source has now been identified as horseshoe bats in China. Uh, Nipah virus, which is very closely related to the Hendra virus, has caused big um, numbers of deaths in um, uh, Malaysia and uh, the, instead of the horse, the pig was the intermediate host. And in Bangladesh, they've also found Nipah virus with no intermediate um, vector, and, and that's associated with fruit um, being contaminated by bats and then being eaten by people, and a lot of people have died there. And of course, um, the other big one is that uh, you know, 30 years on, um, we've eventually found out that Ebola is now carried, the natural host is um, um, bats in Africa. So uh, there's something about the immune system in bats that allows them to carry these viruses and then allow them to be spread mm -hmm. to intermediate hosts or directly to humans. All right, and so it's mostly going into livestock <coughs> that's being eaten or handled by humans. And then you mm -hmm. also mentioned that uh, yeah. bat poo on fruit, not such a good idea either. Sure. Now I think you know one of the big things is that uh, uh, all the predictions are that um, SARS, avian influenza, are not the last big new and emerging mm -hmm. disease, there's more to come. And we're almost certain mm -hmm. to see more in, in the next few years. 
um, there's a high probability um, that it'll be associated with wildlife or bats, um, which then affect animals, which then affect humans. So this crossover, uh, these mm -hmm. days people are talking about um, one health, one ecosystem approach to health, where you need to get all the sectors, um, the wildlife sector, the animal health sector, and the public health sector working together to control these diseases, but also controlling them at source. Mm. Um, and because a lot of these things are coming out of Asia, um, and uh, that's close to Australia, we need to think not only about what we do here, but also what's happening elsewhere. Mm -hmm. Could I just yeah. chip in, but, but bringing it back to sort of the rural uh, doctors, there are a lot of people who pick up bats, for example, up in mm. the sort of northern, northern Queensland, also northern, northern Western Australia. There might be an injured bat and they might pick it up. And there's bat rescue centres and, and uh, the bats get taken into veterinary surgeries and vets themselves handle bats. Never picking up another bat ever <laughs> no, again, I can tell it, you. But, it, but it, it, it certainly is worth, you know, worth considering, you know, that uh, these, these the, uh, a, a bite from a, from a bat can be a very dangerous thing and should be treated accordingly. So if someone comes in and says that they picked up a bat and it bit them, I would say mm. treat them as if they possibly had rabies. Mm. Give them all the, mm. the because the, the uh, prophylactic mm. vaccinations that are used are very, yeah. very effective yeah. and they cross react with the classical rabies. So the Australian mm. bat lysivirus and rabies are... So yeah. only if they've been bitten and got sick or you would just no, give it... No, 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 no. Just as I say, do it prophylactically because you know these things uh, the, of the two mm. people that have died of Australian bat virus in Australia, one of them had a two-year incubation period. Oh, which mm. you know you should. Oh, yeah. And what uh, showed no symptoms during that time? Not until not until latterly, when uh, classic rabies symptoms came in. Oh. Also, there's indigenous populations in the north of Australia that uh, catch and eat flying foxes, mm -hmm. and uh, they're catching them without any protective gear and whatever, and therefore they could be exposed to any number of these diseases as well. Mm. Now you're talking about controlling the spread of these diseases. Obviously we're not going to go around with a 22 and shoot reflying fox that there is. No. How do you control something that, that's spreading like that? Well, again, I think uh, we're, we're talking about hygiene. Uh, I use the word um, biosecurity. And uh, I think uh, what we've got to do is um, at a national level because a number of these things are coming from outside. Yep. Australia has the best quarantine systems in the world. But uh, as we know, they can break down as, uh, as occurred with the equine influenza recently. So we've got to make sure we've got the strongest um, quarantine uh, systems. I think Australia needs to do more work offshore where these diseases are coming from to try and um, reduce the risk of them coming in in the first place. But then at the local level, I think it's uh, all about, uh, because you can't, uh, except for the um, uh, rabies, where you can actually put in place uh, preventive and reactive um, programs for vaccination, you can do something about that. But a lot of the others you can't, and therefore you've got to rely on people taking good biosecurity precautions. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, a lot of it, as you said, is, is really basic um, hygiene. Mm. And that includes health professionals um, who are dealing with these, because the thing about recent history has shown that you can't predict what the next disease is. The next patient that comes into your clinic, the next animal that comes into a veterinarian's clinic, could have something that's unusual. And a lot of us become quite blase about it. And I think um, uh, things like the Hendra virus uh, really demonstrates that we've got to be prepared for the worst rather than... Okay. Uh, was that a vet who wasn't washing his hands? Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Uh, well, th this is, this is uh, a... Um, in each case, it, it's about um, uh, veterinarians who were dealing with infected animals. And they might have even got them before they actually knew what it was, but they certainly didn't know what the disease was, but they were just doing their normal thing. You can't be absolutely sure, but there's a, a strong pro possibility or probability that if they had have taken good um, uh, hygiene precautions, the, uh, it may not have occurred, or at least the risk would have been much lower. If you actually look at equine influenza as a good example, you had an outbreak of um, equine influenza in a quarantine station, and that's not bad because that's where outbreaks are supposed to occur in quarantine, yeah. so they can find out. But someone, and they're not quite sure through all the reports, but it's almost certain that uh, an owner, a veterinarian, or someone else had moved into and out of the quarantine station uh, without uh, taking uh, normal hygiene precautions as required, and then had spread the disease two days before it got picked up in the quarantine, and in the meantime, it spread throughout New South Wales and, mm -hmm. and Queensland. So, but that's, again, a, a case of just good hygiene, good basic biosecurity 
um, would have prevented that. But just going back to the thing you were saying before about the bats and people yeah. eating fruit that have been bitten yeah. by bats, I mean, that's something that, I mean, it, it would be fairly hard to determine, wouldn't it? That's, that's right, but what the, the evidence is in, in Bangladesh where it's happened, it's not so much, well, might have been biting, but also just uh, um, uh, defecating, um, mm. you know, body fluids um, being on the fruit and then people eating it. And uh, there's, there's enough evidence to suggest that's the way it's transmitted in that, uh, that environment. Wash it and peel it, wash yeah. it and peel it. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. This is why yeah. it's, it's also very important to try to understand the ecology and the epidemiology of these diseases, you know, and, and to, put, you know, to, to put money into mm. research. Because the, you know, the sooner you can find out about some of these new and emerging diseases, the sooner you can put in place control mm. measures. You can't put in place control measures till you understand mm. how they spread and where they spread from and mm. you know, what, what are the modes of transmission. So. Yeah, We're yeah. very active participants in the Australian Biosecurity um, uh, um, uh, Cooperative Research Centre for Emerging Infectious Diseases and uh, scientists from the Australian Animal Health Laboratory in Geelong and also in the uh, Department of Primary Industry in Queensland who have actually identified this link with bats and in fact they also identified the source of, uh, uh, of uh, SARS being in bats in China as well. Mm. Well moving to smaller vectors <laughs> and there are plenty of those that seem to be uh, floating in despite our biosecurity. I hear that clouds of mosquitoes can float across the Torres Strait and that we've had dengue outbreaks in Queensland and along the north coast as a result. Are we at risk from mozzies, fleas, ticks? Other nasty. Well, let, let's stand talk about uh, some of the others. But in terms of the mosquitoes, I think you'll find that mosquitoes have probably come off boats and other things at ports in Cairns, mm -hmm. for example, rather than across the Torres Strait. The Torres Strait is a major avenue for a number of different uh, um, diseases, like uh, Japanese encephalitis has moved down through there. A number of plant diseases, uh, bee disease, and other things. So, uh, and there's only a hundred kilometres from Cape York to Papua New Guinea, and only four kilometres from the closest Australian islands to the, Pup to the Papua New Guinea coast, so that's a, 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 an avenue. But I think you'll find that the, the mosquitoes, and we've now got the mosquitoes, um, Aedes aegypti and the uh, um, others that are capable of carrying dengue, chikungunya um, virus um, uh, as well, and therefore um, by establishment of uh, population, say up in the north of Western Australia and the north of Queensland, we then become exposed to these diseases, which are pretty serious. Mm -hmm. And Stan was well, going just, to tell us just about... Just keeping on the mosquitoes for about 30 seconds, the, you know, ob there's endemic mosquito-borne viruses uh, in uh, Australia and Western Australia. The Department of Health has a, a monitoring program where they keep sentinel chickens up north to see which diseases are, are floating around. And Murray Valley encephalitis and Ross River virus are two that are... Yeah. You know, uh, Murray Valley encephalitis not being particularly common, but it is a nasty disease, or can mm. be a nasty disease, and Ross River virus, which is becoming increasingly common, and they have wild animal reservoirs, so mm. Ross River and kangaroos and Murray Valley and, and wild birds up in the sort of northern northern areas mm. there. But, you know, as well as mosquitoes, there's lots of other vector-borne diseases, uh, and the ticks and fleas that we've talked about earlier mm. uh, are certainly... Uh, making it a big impact in many parts of the world and, and we think increasingly in Australia yeah. too. Now I seem to remember that you could get quite a lot of tick-borne diseases in Queensland. Do we not have those in Western Australia? Well the classic one was uh, Queensland tick typhus they called it, yeah. uh, or more correctly Queensland spotted fever. And uh, the spotted fever because of the, the rash that you get mm -hmm. on uh, the typical spots that uh, people get. I'm afraid I don't have a picture of spotted fever but uh, I've got That's a, a right. picture, what I do have is a picture of the kangaroo tick, which is the, probably the most common tick in Western Australia. Yes. And uh, many, of, many of those. Many of, <laughs> many, many, we're working with, uh, with rogainers and, and various people. It's a three host tick, so the larvae, the nymphs and the adults all drop off after they've had a blood feed, molt and clamber back on again. So they've got the chance to sort of bite three different animals in which humans are incidental hosts. And uh, we've, we've got evidence of, a, of uh, a number of cases of spotted fever in Western Australia that when people that have never been out the state and our research has now uncovered a, a, a novel rickettsia species in kangaroo ticks at a very high level and uh, we're working very closely with uh, UWA, Dr Angus Cook in the School of Population Health and Dr John Dyer who's the infectious disease specialist at Fremantle Hospital mm -hmm. with a keen interest. We're working with a group of Rogainers and that's not the people that dye their hair, but uh, that's the, these are these mad people that run around the, the bush for about 24 hours and, and 
regularly pick up ticks, so they're kindly donating blood to us and blood samples, and, and we're trying to see you know what the risks are. But you know, if I can put out a plea to any of the, the rural practitioners, if anybody comes down with a suspected spotted fever, having been bitten by ticks, please contact myself or John Dyer because we're we're looking for the the missing link. We haven't got the actual case that's uh, that's tied in. We know, yeah so. But, uh, Can I just go back to the mosquitoes just for one second? Is it inevitable that the dengue fever and so on that's you know in Queensland at the moment will end up in Western Australia, for instance? Well, it really depends. Uh, 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 those we know that those mosquitoes have arrived um, in northern um, ports at various times, and it's it's about a matter of having um, significant populations of those vectors um, present, and then the diseases can uh, can follow as well. I could just go into the final vector, if you like, the humble cat flea, which is also found on dogs. Mm -hmm. uh, in historical times, it was the spreader of bubonic plague, or the fleas were, but uh, we fortunately don't have plague here in, in Australia. But we certainly uh, have been investigating fleas and have found quite a high level of uh, another rickettsial infection in cat fleas, including uh, an Australian, uh, it was a, a typhus, murine typhus, which is a rat-borne typhus, which many of the, uh, the older practitioners, possibly down in the Albany re region, uh, would, would know about because cases were diagnosed quite, quite commonly in, in the 1950s and 60s uh, of this murine typhus spread by the cat flea. And there's a new species of rickettsia called rickettsia felis, which causes a spotted fever that's associated with cat fleas. So people that are bitten by cat fleas, which is uncommon, they prefer to bite cats, but uh, can come down with, uh, with symptoms of spotted fever as well. So. Okay. Well, thanks for that. We'll have to wind it up there. So um, I have to send you out for a protective suit, though. Oh, I was going to say, yes, I'm going to go home and wash my dog. <laughs> I'm going to go home and wash everything. Our final story tonight looks at initial assessment and management of snake bite. And Dr Stephen Langford should be well known to most of you as the medical director of the Royal Flying Doctor Service. Now, we dropped in to the RFDS headquarters in Jandicott, where Stephen kindly showed us his pressure bandaging prowess. He also gave us his advice on how to best respond to a presentation of snake bite, especially if there's no actual evidence of envenomation. The management of snake bites, just like any other patient. You take a history, you examine the patient, and you do some extra tests. So firstly, just in taking a history, you want to get a clear idea of whether the patient saw the snake latch onto their leg and bite it ferociously, or as is often the case, whether they were intoxicated at night, having a bit of a stroll through the bush, and then they felt something sharp on their calf. And I guess uh, it's easy to say some people have just got a stick bite, but I, I would uh, encourage people to take what patients say seriously and treat snake bite seriously. If someone's bothered to come to you uh, concerned about a snake bite, then you've got to treat it as such. On the examination, um, you may see um, a bite, well often you don't. Um, they're very small fangs, it may only be one tiny puncture wound, it could be a scratch. But, um, and, and that's not really uh, pathognomonic of a snake bite. Um, but it's the systemic symptoms that are really going to guide treatment. So if the patient uh, comes in with any evidence of coagulopathy, uh, if they come in with any uh, signs of neurotoxicity, uh, ptosis, diplopia, facial weakness, then you know, they're significant signs of systemic envenomation that require treatment. But it's important to differentiate between someone being bitten and someone being envenomed. You can be bitten by a snake, you can have a, a decent bite, but it may not be a poisonous snake, it may be a snake that just doesn't seem to have injected any venom. Um, whereas on the other hand you may have trouble determining that there's really a bite site, but if they've got the signs of envenomation then they're going to need treatment. There's no instruction manual for snakes that tells them how much venom to inject. And so the actual dose that a patient may get can be very variable. Depends on the season, whether the snake's bitten uh, another critter beforehand, whether it's really latched in and pumped the venom in, or just had a glancing scratch. And so the amount of anti-venom you need depends on how much venom you've got on board to neutralise. The current teaching certainly uh, recently has been in Western Australia that for brown snake you need quite a lot of uh, amples, maybe five, maybe ten although there has been some research coming out nationally that's suggesting that perhaps we don't need that much. But really, the amount of anti-venom given is that required to neutralise venom and to uh, get a recovery in the, um, 
in the test results, particularly the clotting, clotting tests. And there's a small proportion of patients that may get an anaphylactic type reaction, so it has to be given with uh, adrenaline available and some resuscitation facilities. But generally the push is for monovalent venoms, not polyvalent venoms, and this minimises the antigenic load and the risk of uh, side effects. There's certainly a lot of myths in treating snake bite. We don't put on tourniquets, we don't cut the wound, we don't suck the venom out. Um, you don't really have to urinate on it or wash it or swap. In fact, you know, we encourage people not to wash the bite site because that's where we may be able to get um, a sample for the VDK. I had a friend bring me back something from Walmart in the US and it's a snake bite kit and it's got all the stuff you don't need. It's got a rubber tourniquet, it's got a, a blade in there to cut the wound and it's got these little suction cup things. But basically in Australia, you just put a pressure immobilisation bandage on and that works really well. I'm going to demonstrate the pressure immobilisation technique. This was developed in the 70s by Strawn Sutherland and Jim Tibbles in Melbourne when they studied the transfer of venom in uh, monkeys and found that it passes up the lymphatics rather than um, through the venous system. And the whole idea is just to compress our lymphatics to stop the venom spreading. We have a patient uh, here who hopefully isn't how he would arrive in a hospital. We'd expect that a uh, doctor shouldn't need to do this because a uh, patient would have come in and either first aiders, uh, ambulance staff or nursing staff would have immediately put on a pressure immobilisation bandage. So we have here a, a demonstration patient and we'll pretend that they've been bitten in the uh, medial side of the lower leg on the right side. You take a 15 centimetre, six inch bandage Preferably not a standard crepe bandage, but uh, more of an elastic one. Good, there we go. So we start with putting the bandage directly over the wound. There doesn't need to be any sort of pad on it. Um, and you don't uh, wash or irrigate the bite site because you may well be taking a swab uh, to determine if there's any venom. And the textbooks say run it down the leg, but uh, principally as long as you're running it up the leg and compressing the lymphatics, then you'll be stopping the flow of venom. So you put it on about as tight as you might for a, a sprained ankle. It's certainly not a tourniquet, but it needs to be firm enough to compress those lymphatics and stop the venom spreading. And in a tall patient like this, uh, one bandage may not be enough. We run it all the way up the leg as far as we can. and then attach it. Now this technique is called the pressure immobilisation technique and immobilisation is also very important. It's no good putting the bandage on and letting the patient hobble around or walk. They must keep still because any movement is going to increase the flow of venom up through the lymphatics. So the bandage is put on whether it's out in the field uh, or it's in a hospital and the patient must be kept still. You may want to splint the leg if you've got something, uh, some long, uh, you know, wooden stick, but keeping the patient still. We see uh, a number of problems arise fairly regularly, unfortunately. The first is patients not being treated when they've got signs of envenoming. If you've got signs of systemic envenoming and a coagulopathy, you must have uh, anti-venom. The other is patients being treated when they're not envenomed, just because there was a good story of a snake bite and maybe a positive VDK test patients being treated even though they don't have systemic signs. The VDK venom detection kit does have uh, some false positives and is helpful for identifying the type of venom if the patient has signs of envenoming. But it doesn't confirm that the venom actually got into the body or that the patient is envenomed. So it's a handy adjunct if you're going to have to treat. I think a few of the other problems are the bandage being taken off when there aren't adequate resuscitation uh, and investigation facilities available and then the patient collapses and we're, we're left in a difficult situation. If a patient's had proper first aid, they've had a pressure immobilisation bandage put on uh, um, promptly, they've been immobilised and then brought to you in the hospital, we know that that pressure immobilisation technique will work for many hours. And so they will, well, could have been envenomed, but the venom's all um, kept down there in the leg, so they're not going to have any signs. This is all about clinical judgment, something which country doctors have to exercise all the time. 
if you've got a good story of a snake bite and you've got the pressure bandage on, you don't take the bandage off until you're set up and able to do uh, the blood tests, clotting tests, and able to give anti-venom. If you're not in uh, a situation where you can do that, then you really should keep the bandage on and have the patient transferred. And that involves calling not only the RFDS, but also getting some advice from uh, uh, clinical toxicologists just through the normal poisons line 13, 11, 26. There's some very uh, enthusiastic emergency doctors in Perth and around Australia that are happy to work through that history with you and help you make a judgment as to whether this is a, a likely bite or not. I mean, if you've got a, a patient that uh, was drinking last night and uh, stumbled through the bush and thought they might have been bitten and they haven't had any first aid on and they stagger in at nine o'clock the next morning to you and they haven't got signs of envenoming, then it's unlikely they had a snake bite. But uh, if they get to you promptly with good first aid, then I think you take it seriously. And our thanks to Dr Stephen Langford. If you'd like more information about snake bite or any other animal poisons, the Australian Venom Research Unit website is a really good place to start. You can visit the site at www.avru, that's A-V-R-U, dot org. There's also an excellent article called Snake Bite, A Current Approach to Management, and it's published by Australian Prescriber, and you can access that online as well at www.australianprescriber, or one word, dot com. And that's just about all we have time for tonight, but I'd like to ask for any final thoughts from the panel. Mm. Well, Geraldine, one thing is please tell the patients, don't rely on, the, well, tell the doctors, don't rely on the patient identification of the snake, even if they say that they're a snake expert, um, particularly if they say, oh, I was bitten by a brown snake, because many of our brown coloured snakes actually only respond to black snake antivenom. And if they bring the snake chopped up into 15 little pieces in which a plastic you've actually bag, had, which you? they do, then the best place to actually do the venom detection, if you wish to use the venom detection kit to identify what anti-venom to give, take a swab from the snake's fang. Let's go into the source, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and final thoughts from you, John? Yeah, I, I think if we want to prevent these things, um, everyone needs to play their part in their own personal biosecurity and uh, health, and that could be from people involved at national levels through to health professionals, veterinarians, and uh, livestock and pet owners. And Stan? Yeah, I'd just like to say that uh, please remember that these things aren't as common as we're probably making them out to be. <laughs> so don't go, don't, don't go to bed scared at night, but uh, also to, to work closely with your local veterinarians, and they know what's around. They've, they've done a lot of, uh, had a lot of uh, work, done a lot of work on these. And uh, yeah, this one health business can work just as well in a rural area and, uh, as it can internationally so work closely with them and know where your patients come from particularly those who are handling animals and the types of diseases they might be likely to have and hygiene 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 wash your hands is about all it takes to prevent 90 percent of zoonotic diseases now before we go, a quick reminder of that questionnaire that was recently sent out with the latest edition of the Rural Health Matters newsletter. Currently they're planning programming for 2009 and the questionnaire is your opportunity to make suggestions for topics to be covered in the coming year. Now it also provides for other feedback that's going to help the program continue to improve and to make sure that it's relevant to you and to your practice. So really encourage you to take a couple of minutes to complete the form and return it to Rural Health West. And don't forget that if you'd like to review this program or any previous program, a delayed transmission will be available via internet web streaming next week through the Rural Health West website. That's at www.ruralhealthwest.com.au. And you can watch the programs online or you can download them as video or audio podcasts and listen to them at your leisure. Now the program will be back again on the 4th of November, uh, focusing on common problems with sight and hearing. Really looking forward to your company then. And thanks again to our studio panel tonight, Olga Ward, John Edwards and Stanley Fennick. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks Geraldine. Yeah. Thanks very much, that's great. And thanks to you for taking the time to join us tonight. Hope you've enjoyed it. Good night. <laughs>